How will we win? Somewhat broad and ambiguous question, so let me be more specific. How will Canada win, not just compete, but win on the global stage? And what do we need to do to get there? With the rise of India, China, South America, Africa, and the countries therein, we need to think about winning. But a more important question I'm going to ask today is, do we care? Do you care if we win? Or are you content to go at the pace that we're going at right now and plod along? Life is good. But the world has changed. And in my hallway conversations with people citing, you know, around a, a water cooler or a hallway conversation, call it what you will, you might be surprised to ask that I'm even asking the question, do you care if we win? And inevitably, most people kind of, kind of gasp and go, well, of course we care. In the context of not just competing on the global stage, but winning, it's important for the future of our economic and social prosperity. Well, that said, I'm not sure that we really do care. 49.2%. 49.2% of eligible voters in the 2011 provincial election in Ontario opted to participate in the democratic process, the right, and actually voted. 49.2%. And I ask the question, and perhaps better served as a correlation, that if our elected officials are put into government to represent the infrastructure and the policy of this nation, and only 49.2% of Ontarians said, I care who's representing us, therefore I will cast my vote. Do we care? I'm not sure. And what's more alarming is not this as a snapshot. What's more important is the broader trend that this represents, not just in our province, but our country. And if you look at the last 50 or so years in Canada, this is a continuing trend. And the pundits and the journalists and, the, and, and an array of thought leaders on this topic say there's an array of factors that are contributing to this trend in Canada over the last 50 years. And one of my personal favorites is maybe it has something to do with the weather. And you smile and you say, well, yeah, that, that's probably true. If it's pouring rain and it's icy and it's cold, people may just want to not bother and go out to the polls and cast their vote. But the reality is, in 2011, on this day in the province of Ontario for the election, it was partly sunny across nearly all the province, and it was unseasonably warm. So I don't really think it's a crazy question to ask, do we care? And this broader trend is driving a sense of apathy, ambivalence, and something that quite frankly, is abysmal. To be treated as a call to action, in my opinion. But let me pause there and just ask a, a, another more insightful question, perhaps. Is this a made in Canada problem? Is this apathy, ambivalence, something that us as a developed nation shares with others? And again, if you draw the correlation of the importance of participating in the democratic process of caring, I wanted to know, are we alone? So I embarked on a, a rudimentary assessment and asked the question, well, let's compare ourselves with a peer nation. And I picked Australia. And I picked Australia for a variety of reasons. Large country, small population, therefore low population density, similar style of government, relatively stable healthcare and financial institutions, good academic institutions, English speaking, we share a lot of similarities with that nation. And I asked the question, well, do Australians care? Do they care about their future economic and social prosperity to compete on the global stage? Do they care? And the reality is, the measure I use is in the 2010 federal election in the country of Australia, voter turnout was 93.2%. 
And what's important, again, not just the snapshot, for nearly 100 years, Australians have come out and said, we care because our elected officials represent our interests, they provide the policy and the infrastructure to enable our country to compete, but more importantly, win on the global stage. 93.2%, and that is a consistent trend on the provincial, state, and the federal level. They care, but why? What is so different if I liken them to a peer nation? What is it? And the reality is, in the electoral process, in the country of Australia, it's compulsory. You have to vote. And if you don't vote, you get a ticket. Think of it as analogous to a parking ticket. The monetary implications in relative terms isn't really significant, but it's still a ticket. And what does that say? Well, to me that says, nearly 100 years ago, the Australian government said it is so important to engage our civilians in the democratic process that we're going to put a monetary implication surrounding the action of voting. Yes, it is a right. You can go into the ballot, uh, the, the ballot booth in Australia, spoil your vote, but at least you're engaged. It has become embedded in part of your social fabric. And I asked the question, well, that's quite interesting. And could that happen in Canada? Could we embed that in our social fabric? Would that work? Someone born today in Australia isn't thinking that, oh my God, I have to vote to avoid the ticket. Someone born today, 18 years from now, it's just entrenched. They're going to do it. They don't debate the fact anymore that is it compulsory, is it not? There are many peer nations to Canada that are developed economies that have compulsory voting. We have tried many mechanisms in our country and, is it not, and it is not working. So maybe this is something to consider. So if you think of compulsory civic engagement among, among an array of opportunities, it isn't that far-fetched in our country. The reality is, we're doing it today. Most high schools, most academic institutions, be they university, high school, or colleges, have a compulsory element before you graduate that you contribute back to your community. Volunteerism. You need to do it. It's a choice, but then again, the choice of graduating is also an option that may not happen if you don't contribute those hours. The corporate community, the corporate community in Canada, for your annual performance review that assesses how well are you doing in your job, many companies have implemented something known as a balanced scorecard. They look at your performance in an array of four quadrants. One might be financial and sales, one might be operational efficiency, but one of those quadrants that has historically been there and will continue to be there is something called community engagement. Our corporation and our corporate community, rather, in Canada says it's important for our employees to give volunteerism, volunteer hours, whatever it might be in any shape or form, back to their community. And not alike in Australia, you have the right not to do it, but you get a ticket equivalent in the sense that your variable bonus in that large company, even if you hit the other ones out of the park, it's going to impact you monetarily just a little bit. So the corporate community is saying, this is important. So you extend that even to a, a true made in Ontario example. The rate of return for beer bottles and liquor bottles in the province of Ontario to the beer store is 94% for a mere nickel or a dime. The financial element is irrelevant. It really is when you really think about it. But what it's doing is that that organization has said it is critically important to the future of our economic and social prosperity as a country to defer stuff going to the landfill that we're going to put just a little incentive in to say let's do this let's have a broader impact so if i take that analogy and say okay compulsory civic engagement it's going to take on many different forms but i go back to the question i said at the onset of well, how will we win? So the democratic engagement process is one really critical, important thing, but what really drives our economy in Canada? 
What is the major driver of job and wealth creation in our country? What is the one thing, perhaps among others, but what is the one key thing that we need to get right to ensure our sustained economic prosperity? And the reality is, it's entrepreneurship. Believe it or not, entrepreneurship startups drive our economy. And as a unique data point, of all new companies started today in Canada, only 4 to 10 percent of those companies will become high growth firms. Only 4 to 10 percent will become high growth firms, ones that will drive a material number of jobs and wealth for our economy. But what's more important, the top 5 percent of that cohort will drive two thirds of the new jobs. We need to ensure that we get that right. And when you bundle that all down, what is the one core thing? What is the one core thing? And there's about four or five. But what is the one core thing that really helped those companies grow? You may be surprised to learn it's mentorship. If you're starting a new company today or you're a small enterprise and want to get to that next level, Yes, you may need capital. Yes, you may need access to customers. Yes, you may need access to partners. But the number one thing in repeated surveys in the Canadian startup and entrepreneurship landscape that they need is access to mentorship. So now let's draw the parallel back to the democratic process. If startups and entrepreneurship will drive the vast majority of job creation and make our country more economically prosperous on the global stage, and mentorship is a core ingredient in there, I propose that we figure out a financial incentive way, some monetary incentive way, to make mentorship mandatory. And that could take on a whole array of forms. It doesn't have to be for those mentors, potentially, who are not suited to be. Fine, there are ways around that. But we could think of creative ways to do that. And a really unique data point, again, Early stage companies, entrepreneurial endeavors that drive the vast majority of job creation, for the ones that have good quality mentors, they raise seven times more capital and they grow four times faster. The data is there and we know what the challenge is. And if we want to take a position, we need to figure out as a country a way to prime the pump. Let's explore some of these financial incentive models to say economically prosperous, sustainable startups. Why don't we try this? And at a tactical level, this can take on many different forms. It's a very different way of looking at it. You can't force someone to be a mentor. But one way you could consider doing this, the people that are successful and you draw the correlation from a monetary perspective, imagine a world where you're filling out your income tax forms. You do it on an annualized basis. Flip to page two and there's a section that says number of hours of mentorship and to whom did you supply them? And you know what? You're not going to lie because the Canadian Reven Revenue Agency has a very good audit. Be it a random audit process, you don't want to get caught. And that will say, hey, perhaps there's an indirect tax benefit model. And the individuals who contribute back might get something out of it. And all I am doing by suggesting this is let's just prime the pump. Let's let this community know that mentorship is a critical way that will drive the future of our economic and social prosperity as a country. We need to address this. Gone are the days of ambivalence and, and apathy. It can't happen anymore. And we need to figure out a creative way to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I firmly believe this model is how we will win. Thank you.